to Griffin Update Sports, a student-produced show all about Missouri Western Athletics. We've got it all every week. Highlights, games, players, fans, and every sport all year long. Welcome to Griffin Update Sports. I'm Jake Michael. And I'm Morgan Doyle. This past week in Missouri Western sports, women's soccer had a 1-0 win over Missouri Southern and a 2-0 win over rival Northwest for the team's third straight win. Women's tennis competed in their first match of the season at the Augustana Invitational. In singles, Federica Samaso, Claudia Iglesias, and Maria Barosta all came out on top. In doubles, Iglesias and Carolina Strom beat two different Rockhurst pairs, and Claire Donnelly and Catherine Yeager also won against Rockhurst. Volleyball had their first home game of the season on Friday and lost to Central Missouri. Reporter Bo Baker was there to give us the recap. Missouri Western Volleyball had their first home game this past week where they lost to the rival Jennies in a close matchup, losing 3-1. to one. Just coming home and being able to show people that, you know, yeah, we might have lost a few games on the road, but we can hang with these ranked teams. UCM is always a tough opponent to play against, despite what year it is or what sport we are competing against them in, especially when it comes to volleyball. They just do the small things right every time, which is what we're trying to get towards, so they're a great competitor. They're really good defensively, so it's really hard to score on them. And they're just, you know, in control of the ball, and so um, that's kind of hard to find um, in volleyball nowadays, so I think that's kind of what puts them up there for a little bit. You always have to look at the positives when it comes to your losses and the fact that you've learned some lessons that you can take away from the game that you can use to help you for the rest of the season. It's now just putting all the pieces together and figuring out what makes our team special from other teams so we can be successful. Griffin Volleyball is back on the road this week as they face Emporia State and Washburn. Good luck, ladies. Now for Griffin Media, this has been Bo Baker. Now that was Western's third straight ranked opponent. The MIAA is just such a tough conference to say the least. It definitely is, Jake. And they've got another ranked opponent coming up. After Emporia this Thursday, the Griffs will go to play number three Washburn over the weekend. And while we're on the subject of volleyball, one Griffin recently reached a career milestone. During the jury invitational, setter Lauren Murphy recorded her 3,000th career assist. Update sports reporter Chris Tenpenny sat down with her to get her thoughts on the milestone and got us the inside scoop. Check out what she had to say. Missouri Western setter Lauren Murphy became just the third Griffin in program history to record 3,000 career assists. Okay, I'm not going to lie, it meant a lot, you know, um, especially like during high school, I didn't get to go out a lot, like I didn't get to hang out with my friends because I was always at volleyball. Um, so being able to make that much of a difference already in college, and I'm not even done with this season, um, it just kind of puts into perspective that hard work that I've put in through high school and the hard work that I've put in through so far uh, through my college career. <laughs> it just, it meant a lot, and it was really special to me. Murphy has been one of the Griffin's most consistent players throughout her career, earning all MIAA first team in 2017 and all MIAA second team in 2018. It's a really great um, reflection of her work ethic and the time that she has put into this program and into her own development, um, but also just being a really great teammate and always being about the team um, and, and just trying to really put up numbers because that's what we need to win. You know, not selfishly, um, but just because, you know, it's her job. Now, assists may not be the flashiest of stats, but setters need to know everything about the opposing team and their own. It's a lot of work. Oh, I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot of stuff that goes through my head, and that's kind of why I love being a setter so much. Is that there's a lot of like technicalities to it, a lot of strategy behind it, because you got to think of who's front row with you, who the other blockers are, what the other blockers are doing, what your hitters are doing, what play you're gonna run, and so I'm trying to find the best way you know, where the other blocker's going. So I'm like up here trying to look at the ball, but I'm also looking over here trying to see what that middle's doing. And so it's a lot, but that's why I love being a setter so much is that you're literally the core of the team. You are the quarterback of the team. And that's just, it's my thing. <laughs> With 3,000 assists accomplished, Murphy now looks towards the all-time assist record. But maybe even more importantly to Murphy 
is continuing to build a stronger program. Um, a lot of coaches that, um, that I've had like throughout high school and middle school, it's always leave the program better than you found it. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. If I break the record at the same time, I mean, hey, that's pretty cool too. But, you know, like I said, I'm just trying to do whatever I can to leave this program better than I found it. Murphy currently sits at 3,188 assists on her career, just 742 off the record. The record was set by Teresa Hand, who played for the Griffins back in 2002 to 2005 and is a former teammate of Coach Carbon. It'll be fun to watch Murphy chase this record for the rest of the season. For Griffin Media, I'm Christopher Tenpenny. Chris is here to talk with us a little more about Lauren. Chris, now she's really close to that program record. How doable do you think that is for her? Oh, it's very obtainable for her to reach that record. It is going to be close. She's a little behind the pace right now, but there's still a lot of games left. Something she does have in the bag, though, is in about the next seven to eight games, she's going to be second all time if she keeps her current pace. So she at least has that going for her, and it'll be interesting to see if she can get the top record at the end of the season. It's awesome how even with this accomplishment, she's still so humble and team-oriented about everything. Oh, yeah, that's something she made wanted to make clear is that she wanted to get the team back to its winning ways after down 2018 and that she just she wants to leave the program better than what she found. So while she would love to get the record, building the team and the program is definitely her number one priority. Well, that's definitely a good outlook to have on everything, and the volleyball team is probably going to miss her once she's gone. In other sports news, men's and women's cross country ran at the Southern Stampede down at Missouri Southern with the men placing 10th and the women 14th. Ian Cabet and Megan Gillen both set program records for the Griffins. Recently, the cross country and track and field team has been under new direction. Update sports reporter Tanner Cobb has more information on their new head coach, Cody Engel. Missouri Western's track and cross country team just got his third coach in just three seasons here at Missouri Western. Cody Ingold, who has been the assistant coach since 2017, has been promoted to head coach after Yuri Litvisky unexpectedly resigned. Well, I've been here actually since 2017, so I was part of the, the initial recruiting class, initial uh, the, the start of the program when we had nothing. So um, I, I just worked my way into a position where the administration believed that I could continue on uh, doing the right thing with the program and leading in the right direction. They, they've been here majority of the year last year, so we, you know, we're comfortable with them. You know, we're just missing one person, but we'll get back there. Um, if, if, I mean, it feels good, but uh, you know, it's nothing. Nothing really changes. Um, still working with the kids. You know, there's a more administrative work, but you know, I'm heavily involved in all the whole program as a whole, so nothing changes in that aspect. We we've, we've kept going honestly. Like it was it was a little it was a little rough. Like the day we found out about it, but at the end of the day, we realized there's nothing we could do about it. So I'll keep things pretty uh, pretty much the same. We're going to work towards transitioning, but it's one step at a time. There's no need to change things overnight. Uh, we'll work on it, but they'd only been a week into practice, so it hasn't been that hard. As the track season is just around the corner, Coach Ingle is hoping to help the Griffs move on and focus more on what the season has to come. This is Tanner Cobb reporting for Griffin Media. Tanner's here with us to talk more about this third year program. Tanner, obviously the Litvinsky uh, you know, leaving was very abrupt and it was a little mm -hmm. shocking to these players, but how are they adjusting to this switch? I think they're actually adjusting very well. You know, having Ingold be there since the beginning, not only does he know the culture pretty well at Missouri Western, but he also knows the players well. And, you know, just having that chemistry already with the coach, it can be kind of tough bringing in a new guy, but, you know, they're, they're comfortable with him, so I think it's pretty good. Yeah, and I mean, as a member of the track team myself, I agree with everything you just said. The atmosphere seems to be pretty good. He's been there with us since the start of the program, so I think it'll be a good thing for this team. Absolutely. Well, we'll be looking forward to see what the program accomplishes in the next year and the years to come. Now, last but most definitely not least in sports this week, Griffin football hosted ranked Central Missouri on Saturday. I was there to cover it, and let me tell you, Morgan, it was a roller coaster. These Griffins just look better and better every week. Check it out. In one of the wildest games in Missouri Western football history, the Griffs fell short to Central Missouri 48-45 to in overtime last Saturday. Western's offense had trouble moving the ball in the first half, and the defense did what it could to slow down the firepower of the mules. The Griffs trailed 31-0 with 6.39 left in the third quarter, when then things started to look up. A Trey Vavil 91-yard kickoff return touchdown got the party started, and from there, the Griffs scored a total of 45 points in the second half. This touchdown from Wyatt Staggerwald to Devon Holmes tied the game at 45. I, yeah, I agree with what you said. Oh, double move, Devon!
due to poor clock management and a little too much aggressiveness out of the Mules, the game was sent into overtime. The Griffs did get the first possession of the overtime, which unfortunately ended in a missed field goal from 38 yards. UCM then capitalized on their fourth down field goal attempt in the overtime and took home the win in an unbelievable display of resiliency from the Griffs for a second time this season. Though to say the loss didn't hurt the players and the coaching staff that night is definitely an understatement. It hurts me. It makes me mad. Because it's not who we were. It's not who we are. It's not what I've, told. It's not what I've taught since I've been here. Um, just got to totally outplay it. Um, Effort it. Everything. This is the worst thing I've ever in my life. Uh, wasn't too much adjustment at halftime. We were uh, really in the first half as long as we just came ourselves, shoot ourselves in the foot. Uh, second half, we execute a lot better and give ourselves a chance to win, but can't start like that and expect to win every game. It's safe to say the Griffs have had one of the toughest three game stretches ever to start a season. Now that that is over, they'll have a chance to run the table starting September 28th when they face Northeastern State. Reporting for Griffin Media, I'm Jake Michael. Well, I wish the outcome would have been different, but every game this team just puts on a show. They are so much fun to watch. They really are. They lost to a good team, but they really do have a lot of firepower on offense. It's going to be exciting to see what they do the rest of the year. They, they have a chance to win all the rest of their games, so it should be fun. Well, I was definitely jealous that you got to cover that game, and I didn't, but maybe next week. Coming up next, we have Western Windup host Derek zimmerman Geyer's 60-second hot take. And after Derek, we'll take a quick break for a public service announcement and then come back with a roundtable to end our show. Welcome to Hot Takes with DZG, name confirmed. I am Derek Zimmergeier, host of the Western Windup Podcast. And this isn't culinary school, but I'm ready to dish out some spicy predictions. So let's get it. Drop my needle. Griffin football plays at Northeastern State this Saturday at 2 p.m. And by 3 p.m., the Griffins will have dropped 50 points on the Rohawks. This team is dead last in my ability in general and dead last in points against per game with an average of 59.7. Missouri Washington has scored 35 and 45 against two top scoring defenses and averaging 36 points per game. The Griffins are peeved after that UCM game and look at the least some rage. Griffin football has been around for half a century now, and by they're going to drop as many of those points on halftime. Big dub, obviously. These next two are kind of a two-for-one special. Washington Volleyball took a now number seven ranked Northwest to a fifth set and lost a tough one. Washington lost to another UCM team that was ranked, and the Griffins don't play Northwest again until October 22nd at the Looney Complex. Junior Ali Talkin has 123 kills and averages 3.62 per set, both good for fifth and second in MIAA. With the way they've been playing, Washington is losing a match on this build-up to the rivalry rematch. Meanwhile, the women's soccer team has won its last three games and hasn't let up a goal since two straight. Sophomore Anna Mayer leads it in mind away at 43 saves, so bet on the Griffins as they will not yield a goal for the rest of September. As for September, don't let it close down and don't stop listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire, and don't stop tuning in. For the Washington Wind-Up and Griffin Update, this is Derek zimmerman Geyer signing off. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back. We're here with Update Sports reporter Chris Tenpenny to talk about some Major League Baseball. So. Guys, postseason baseball is right around the corner. What teams are you impressed by right now? Well, with things pretty much already kind of set in place and the, and the playoff picture already looking, you know, like it's set in stone. Got a few guys, a few teams out there that still haven't clinched yet. But uh, I like the Yankees. Uh, you know, they got over 100 wins this year. Uh, they got great offensive firepower. They can definitely hit the ball over the fence. Pretty good, pretty good bullpen. Uh, I, I would say that's going to definitely uh, do a lot for you, especially in the postseason. Postseason pitching is very important. So. Uh, you know, especially with, you know, teams, you know, kind of shortening those guys' weeks, you know, so they can get more starts in. Uh, and if you ever have to bring one of your starters in to finish a game, I think they could do it. Um, but I like the Yankees a lot. Yeah, the Yankees, they're interesting just because, like you said, they have been hurt all year. So, you know, they're still hurt. They lost Dalen Batances, one of their top relievers. He's not going to be in the postseason. And then they have Domingo Herman, who has some – uh, controversy around he won't be in the postseason so that's some pitching taken away so they're gonna have to rely fully on offense so I like the Astros the Astros have probably the top two Cy Young pitchers in Justin Verlander and Garrett Cole 
and they have the best offense in all of baseball. Their lineup is stacked from one through nine, and so I just don't see anybody being able to beat them in a five or seven game series. Now let's talk about, let's stay on the American League. Let's talk about the wild card race going on right now because it is pretty close. And like last Wednesday, all three teams that are in the running for the wild card positions right now, um, I mean, they all won on either like walk-offs or an extra inning. So I think that's just been exciting. I think it's been fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And it's any kind of postseason that winds down and everyone's trying to clinch a spot, uh, you know, it's always exciting. So we'll definitely keep a close eye on them. I think the Indians are probably – uh, pretty close. If I had to pick a wild card team, I, they're probably going to be my pick that kind of slips in. Uh, and then they're a team that actually I think will compete very well in the wild card uh, series. So uh, they're going to be the team that I watch. Uh, you know, they got really good offense, you know, really good offense, really good hitters. Uh, so uh, pitching lacks a little bit, but I think they, they can beat anybody on a given week, especially in a shorter series. CJ, I think the Indians are the team that falls out just because I don't think their lineup is as strong. I like. I like Oakland a lot. Their pitching staff is just a bunch of nobodies, but they, they get results. Fred Anderson and Homer Bailey, who was on the Royals. And then it goes with the offense with Matt Chapman, who's been a star in the making at third base. He might be the best defensive third baseman in the game. So I like Oakland to host, and I like the Rays. The Rays just – they had the Cy Young last year in Blake Snell. He took a step back, but then they signed Charlie Morton, who might be their best pitcher. So those two teams just have a little more than the – Indians to me I may be a little biased not liking the Indians as much as a Royals fan but I just <laughs> I'm just hoping that they are kind of the team to fall back and I think the Rays in Oakland have a have a better chance long term yeah what about the National League what do you think is going to happen there uh well the Dodgers have a good chance of, of making it back to the World Series um you know they, they still have all that offensive firepower um it, the rotation has gotten it's diminished a little bit from year to year um, they're gonna they're gonna a team that is actually when they when they do get going and they get into like a really good hitting rhythm, uh, they're gonna get the guys circling the bases. Uh, but you know when they finally get to that point, I like your Astros pick. I do think it's just it's the Astros and then everybody else that falls under it is just the, the gap is so big. Um, but if I had to pick a National League representative, it's probably gonna be the Dodgers. Yeah, the Dodgers are just they like. They have Cody Bellinger, who's just going to win MVP probably because Kristen Yelich of the Brewers got hurt. Like, they have the MVP. They have Clayton Kershaw still. Somehow we don't even talk about him anymore. He's still one of the best pitchers of all time. Right. So, like, the, the Dodgers are the clear cut in the National League, kind of like the Astros, I think, are the clear cut in the American League. There are a few other teams like the Braves if they get hot. Um, you know, like we said with the Yankees, a few teams that may be able to go on some runs, but – it looks, it looks Dodgers Astros, like we're head Dodgers Astros again. Yeah. So I'm going to be a little biased here. I'm born and raised a Cardinals fan, and I think that I feel like the Braves are doable when the Cardinals clinch the <laughs> division. <laughs> um, the Dodgers we might struggle with, but I'm still, I'm still going to hope for that. But, I mean, they've had the best record since the All-Star break, and they're on like a six-game win streak now. Just swept the Cubs at Wrigley for the first time since like 1921 or something, so – as a Cardinals fan, I'm pretty hyped, and I'm I'm hoping that they can keep going strong. Well, but. and that's justified because you know when you go into the postseason play with that much momentum, you know all of a sudden when you're walking into Bush Stadium and you know and maybe you're the favored team over them, but you know maybe you get that crowd behind you, uh, you know you you all of a sudden the the moment doesn't feel too big for you, for those guys, and so who knows what could happen, you know, with all that kind of momentum going into it, and you just you know you hit your strides at the right time. And you, you could definitely, you know, wreak some havoc. The Cardinals just have this magic to them. Like, I, I don't like their roster nearly as much as the Braves and the Dodgers and even the Nationals in the wild card. Like, but they just, they just somehow pull it out. Like, Matt Carpenter, who's been terrible all year, decide now, last two weeks, <laughs> to turn it on just in time for the postseason, <laughs> yeah. just in time to give them another bat. And so I never want to count the Cardinals out because we see them all the time just go on these runs. But, again, Kansas City over here, so, you know. <laughs> Rooting against the Cardinals. Yeah. yeah. Indifferent fan over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking of Kansas City, any opinions on uh, the announcement of Ned Yost retiring? Well, I mean, you have to appreciate, you know, what he's done for the organization. And though it didn't end the way he probably wanted it to, um, you still can't forget the fact that he did deliver a World Series title um, and got two World Series appearances. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's a great, you know, great career, uh, great, great guy to have uh, in your you know, in your clubhouse, and he'll always be remembered as one of the one of the legends in that clubhouse. Yeah, it was very well said, Jake. I mean, I am one of the fans who disagreed with Ned Yost a lot, and, you know, because I'm that fan. But you can't argue with two pennants, a World Series, like, 
he's a legend. He's gonna have a statue out there in the fountains. Like he's gonna go. He's gonna get his number retired. Um, he does a very good job with young players, and I think that's something that was his niche. He may have not made all the decisions that you want your manager to make, but how he controlled that clubhouse and how he was able to get the, those 2014 and 15 teams just together and wanted to play baseball. Um, it's really admirable, and he, it's, I'm going to miss seeing Nedios on the side. And you talk about developing young talent, and I think that's where they kind of got into the situation where they are now, where all these guys came up with Hosmer and, and Moustakis and Lorenzo Cain and those guys all got really good at the same time, and then all of a sudden, well, now we got to start dishing out some money, and we don't have that. But they all just got really good at the same time, and you know, timing's everything. So you, know, you get a, a World Series pennant out of the deal, and that's great. And the one thing with Ned Yost is he was always good for post-game interviews. You never knew what yet Ned Yost was going to say, and I think that might be the thing I miss most. <laughs> <laughs> is there any word on who will be his predecessor, who's coming next? Um, Mike Matheny, who I'm sure you are uh, very familiar with mm -hmm. over there, is she, he was brought in, I believe, uh, last year um, kind of as like a baseball operations guy, but kind of as the guy to be for Ned Yost. Um, there's a couple other guys in that clubhouse, Pedro Grafal um, and Dave Swayam. Um, who may be options. And then another big one, if the Cubs are upset with Madden, there's been a few Royals fans, people that want them to maybe go out of him, go after him if he does, in fact, leave Chicago. All right, so I know we already touched on this, but I kind of want to end with World Series predictions, like who you think is going to go up against each other, who do you think is going to win it all, and what's your reasoning? Oh, man. Well, I got to go with – I already said the Dodgers are going to represent the, the NL – um, and I want to say the Astros because, my God, they just lead in every single category. Uh, but I'm going to go out on a hunch, and I'm going to say the Yankees uh, just because of uh, that home fan base. You know, you get in the Yankee Stadium, that's a good crowd to have behind you. Uh, and the offensive firepower, obviously. The, the injuries don't help, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Let's see if the offense can keep up. See, I think we get a repeat of the 2017 World Series, Dodgers-Astros. Um, and I love the Astros' whole lineup. But – you never know what's going to happen in the postseason. And the Dodgers have been so close year after year. I wonder if it's almost at the point where it's like the 2015 Royals to where they were so close that they just kind of find that extra gear and the Dodgers are able to defeat the Astros in the World Series this year. I definitely agree with what you're saying about the Dodgers, and I feel like that's a definite possibility. I'm still going to stay, stay a little biased and say Cardinals, World Series, um, and either Astros or Yankees. For some reason, my gut's telling me the Yankees, just because pretty much what you said and all the good offense and everything. But, I mean, that's about Cardinals for sure. And then who cares about the rest of I feel more honestly. comfortable with my Dodgers pick if they were somehow able to retain Manny Machado. I would be so much more comfortable <laughs> with that. But, you know, you still got Bellinger, who's probably going to win MVP. Yeah. Because uh, what happened with Yelich. Um, and that's just too bad that Yelich got hurt. And, you know, otherwise they would have probably made a pretty good run. Yeah. So. Well, they've made they've been doing pretty good without him. Honestly, mm -hmm. they're on a little win streak of their own. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the Brewers are going to sneak in. Looks yeah, like, so. yeah. It definitely does look like it. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking about baseball here in a show or two, anyways, right around the World Series. Oh so. yeah, yeah. We've got it in the works. <laughs> Can't so. wait. So we'll yeah. hopefully, like to bring this guy back. <laughs> yep. All right, and we've got a lot of sports happening here at Missouri Western this week, don't we, Jake? We sure do, Morgan. Men's and women's golf are competing in their respective tournaments as we speak, and volleyball travels to Emporia on Thursday and Washburn on Saturday. Soccer travels to UCM on Friday and Missouri Southern on Sunday, and men's and women's cross country will compete in their home meet on Saturday. Football is away in Oklahoma at Northeastern State University on Saturday, and men's golf will compete in the Panther Invitational on Sunday and Monday in Kentucky. That's all we've got for you this week. Make sure to tune in to Griffin Update next week for the latest campus news and Jake Sports Report. Catch us on Sudden Link Channel 12 and our Griffin Media Vimeo and YouTube channels. From all of us here at Griffin Update Sports, thank you for watching. Welcome to Griffin Update Sports, a student produced show all about Missouri Western Athletics. We've got it all every week. Highlights, games, players, fans, every sport all year long.